to in the beginning we chant a small chant that you can find on the paper kaikyogi on the pridotomoimas mudra me some questions or gave me some topics that they would like to hear me <coughs> say something about. Uh, one was the question, what is the meaning of life? Um, another person wanted to hear something about quitting the game. Uh, so what is that? Uh, what's the meaning of quitting the game? Uh, somebody wanted to hear something about practice in daily life. Uh, like, well, might be easy uh, to practice during a retreat like this here at Antaisi, but how can you sustain practice in daily life? Or, well, what is practice in the first place uh, apart from Zazen during the rest of the hours in the day? Um, there was a question about, well, monkhood, what does it mean uh, to be a monk? Uh, then there was a very, how do you say, well, concrete uh, question uh, during the Zen. What can you do about pain? How to deal with pain during the Zen? Um, then there was another question, how to teach people who are not interested Buddha in Buddhism in the first place. Uh, プラクティス。まあ、修行ですね。修行英語で言うとプラクティスになるんですね。
実践していくでまあ日常の中あんたのような修行道場そこういうリツリートならまあ一日の流れ,に流れに沿っていけばできますけれども家に帰って日常生活の中でどうしたらいいかという問い。What does it mean to be a monk?、えー、まあ、僧侶になることの意味、僧侶とは何なのか、出家することの意味。まあ、特に、えー、タイ、スリランカもそうですし、中国や韓国でも出家するということは家族を持たないという意味もありますけれども、日本では、えー、そういうことでもないので、日本で出家をすることの意味はそもそも何だろう。ゆくゆく結婚して子供を持つならば、そもそも出家と言えるかどうか、そういう。意味も含まれているかもしれない。一つの具体的な質問としては、先生の痛み、痛いという思いとどう付き合えばよいか、この痛いのをどうしたらよいかという質問。これはまあ仏教に全く関心のない人にまあどう教えたらよいのか、全く関心のない人に仏教をどう伝えたらよいかという問いもありました。それ以外に、聞きたいこと、あるいはまあ忘れているのもあるかもしれないですし、これ以外にも聞きたいことがあれば、どうぞ、この時点でも。はい、じゃあ、高橋さんから。はい、えっと、修行して座,あの座禅を一生懸命して、まあ、好きな人とかあの家族とか、まあ、人を幸せにできるすることができる。あのあれあのうんうんうんまあしたしたいんですけど、はい、そうしたいんですけど、はい、そうなれるのか、うん、修行して家族とか他の人を幸せにできるか、まあ、英語にすると Can you make others happy through your back practice? Happy. あもう一つはいお願いします。ビンで先生はありますか。はい。ビンで先生はありますか。え、はい、is there rebirth, transmigration, rebirth is probably the right。リンネ転生とかまあ仏教ではリンネ転生と普通言いますけれども、死んでから生まれ変わる。え、um,。Anything else that you don't find here on the whiteboard but you would like to ask? It's a topic. I,、uh, um, I find、um, every philosophy has its own dilemma.、Mm. Uh, like、uh, if you take something as your first hypothesis, then you cannot do other uh, uh, meta metaphysical. Thinking upon it. That means you have to take it for granted without any other, res any other response.、Uh, and I find out that、uh, Zen, abend、uh, my, my own point from, from my own perspective, is that、uh, the practitioner of Zen t r i e d to abandon all of those、uh, doctrines at least. and、uh, Try, try to、uh, concentrate on the, the moment, just seize the moment and concentrate, simply concentrate on it. And、uh, whenever there is some thoughts or some feelings, emotions, etc.,、uh, just totally accept it without any further、uh, judgment. I mean, it is against, against、uh, if there is a doctrine, maybe it, it is. The fact that uh, uh, Zen is against further judgment. But I think、uh, when it comes to philosophical, philosophical thinking, then the, it also becomes a doctrine. So I don't know how to deal with it about the topic of Hi Hyoka. I mean, Hi Hyoka itself is a Hyoka.、Hmm. So, to in short,、uh... What to do with judging? 
to about the habit that we judge things about judging. ほかに聞きたいこと、はい、お願いします。えっと、私は普段大学で勉強してるんですけど、えっと、それで、えっと、そうですね、うんまあ、この道で行くぞというふうに決めたのにもかかわらずその、その道に一生懸命励むことができないということがあります。うんうん、で、その、ここに来たら一生懸命、励んでる人を見て一生懸命励むということを学べるかなと思ったんですけどここはあのネルテさんもおっしゃってるようにやっぱり大人の場所であってあの仮に2時間座禅をするとしても、まあ、いくらでも怠けることはできるというわけでここに来てもやっぱ自分を変える環境が自分を勝手に変えてくれるってことはな,かないと思っていいファンさんみたいそうなんですね<笑>なんかずっと動く人もおるから<笑><笑>はい、はい、であのどうやったらその、うんまあ、どこにいてもそういう問題が起こる、うん、結局起こってしまうので、はい、そういう励むことができない自分っていうのに対してどうやって対処するべきなのか、うんまあ、知することができるのかっていうことについて伺いたいなと思っていますちょっと難しいけど。はいうんうんうんえー、so, well, for the non Japanese speakers,、uh, basically, he's asking or、well, he's saying, well, he hoped、uh, that during the retreat,、um, seeing others practice diligently would help him to become more diligent in his own life and、uh, follow his task.、Um, but he realized that Antaj is sort of Place for、uh, adult practice, or that every person is responsible for their own life and they are responsible for their own practice. So, how how can you well become able to do this adult practice?、Yeah. Mm. How can you practice as an adult? まあ、大人の修行をどうしたらよいのか、大人として修行するのにどうしたらいいのか、How can you practice as an adult? で、まあ、大人として修行をするということは、自分の修行は自分にするものだという、誰も手伝ってくれないんだという、まあ、自覚ですね。他にありますか Anything else you would like to hear? Kato san wa mana nani mo kite nai desu kero, mo sa. Hai, nanka ari masu ka? Saki no inne tensho to mo ichiko chikai ka mo shinde desu kero. Hai. Ano, Bukyo de ano, roku jinsu de ano, hai, hai. Ari masu ne. Ari wa mufo san do de yoni kangae te desu ka? Naru do. Hai. 6人数というとそのまあ普通の人に見えないものが見えたり聞こえないものが聞こえたりはいはいはいそう he wants to know something about、uh, in Japanese it's called Loku Jinzu well there's also a chapter in the Shobo Genzo I think in English it's、um, translated as mystical powers sometimes um Basically, powers that transcend our ordinary powers, like, like clear vision, for example, or you can read other people's minds, you know, the future or the past,、uh, previous lifetimes, and stuff like that. What about.、Uh, well, in, in Japanese, it's Jinzu. That's also the. Title of the Shobogens or Chapter Jinzu. Basically, mystical powers. Can you a n Anything else? Okay,、uh, let's start with this. And if you have more questions and we have time later,、uh, we can discuss more.
まず人生の意味について、about the meaning of life。The short answer is there's no meaning to life。Nobody knows why we were born。Except for the fact that our parents had sex, obviously, but there seems to be no deeper meaning behind that. And like at one point, maybe as a kid, you ask yourself, why do I have to do my homework?、Uh, why do I have to go to school?、Um, One answer maybe is that if you don't do your homework, then your parents don't give you pocket money. So you won't have pocket money, so you do your homework and you try to get good grades because then you get more pocket money and、uh, you get all the presents that you want for your birthday.、Mm. So, is the meaning of going to school and learning to get pocket money? Well, no. Actually, it's To prepare you for life, but preparing you for life in that case only means that when you study at school, you do your homework, you get good grades, you can go to a better high school, and then you can go to a good university, you can study what you want to study. And if you don't have the good grades, you can't become a doctor, you can't become a lawyer, for example.、Uh, but if you study,、uh, you can. Do that.、Um, can good a good get a good job? So the next question would be, well, what's the meaning to that? So so why would I want to get a job in the first place? Why would I want to work all my life,、uh, five hours a week, maybe six hours a week,、uh, from morning until the evening? And the answer again is well, you need some money to live. So basically, like for kids, you, you want the pocket money, then you do your homework.、Uh, you want uh, money uh, to enjoy yourself, to maybe buy a car, eventually build a house, then you have to work for that. And if you don't have money, you won't be popular with the girls. So if you want to have a girlfriend and maybe in the future a beautiful wife,、um, You need a job, and to get a job, you need to study in school.、Uh, so that's the meaning. That's the meaning. But then the next question is well, why do I need a family and kids? What's the meaning of that? Because I will die, my partner will die, the kids will die, even if I have grandchildren, they will all die. So that cannot be the meaning of life. Of course, the big car and the big house cannot be the meaning of life either because you can't take them with you when you die.、Um, maybe the meaning of life is to do something lasting for humanity. So to win a Nobel Prize and have your name in the history books in 100 years, 200 years. Very few of us will probably、uh, succeed at that, but if it's possible, would that give meaning to our life? Well, the answer again is no, because in probably two, three, four thousand years, nobody will remember you anyway.、Um, even if you do. Well, for example,、um, there's the. The, I think now the fri- future for Friday. Friday is for future movement. I don't know so much about it except from the news.、Um, in my time, when I was、uh, young, the, the Green Party just started in Germany and people were very concerned about the environment. And that's what probably the Fridays for Future、uh, kids are very concerned about. And you would、uh, be against、uh, nuclear power. And stuff like this. And people discovered meaning in this kind of activity. So、uh, it's not that you try to get into the history books, but you do something, try to do something lasting for the planet itself, for nature,、um, for the animals.、Mm. But again, 
if you think on a longer span, like probably in, in 100 billion years, the planet won't exist anymore. That's a long time. But if the fact that in 100 years my life is not there anymore, if in 100 years I'm dead, so it doesn't really matter how much wealth I accumulate, then 100 billion years, it's, it's much more. But if in 100 billion years the planet Earth doesn't exist, it's really hard to claim that, well, protecting the environment is meaningful. And, well, confronted with that, I'm afraid we have to say, well, there's no meaning of life. If you think it through, whatever you do, whatever you achieve, it's going to be gone at one point. Um, So in that sense, there's no meaning to your life. Of course, probably nobody would have noticed if you hadn't been born into this world in the first place. Nobody would have noticed if your mother had an abortion before you were born. So in that sense also, there's really no meaning to the fact that you were born. Um, how about suicide? In my case, I never really made a serious attempt at suicide, but I was thinking about it a lot when I was young. Already as a kid, I was thinking a lot about well, that it's at least a possibility and would make things so much easier. Because, well, that's one of the later questions. That, but when you suppose that there's nothing coming after death, we cannot be sure. But somehow I thought, well, probably if I'm dead, there's nothing. It's going to be the end. In that case, well... There's no more problems. It would solve all problems. And so why not kill myself? In my case, although there was always this kind of temptation, I could always kill myself. Um, the urge was never strong enough so that I would actually kind of buy a rope and already look for a tree where I could hang myself. Um, but a couple of years ago, for example, we had a practitioner here who came and in his back, basically the, the back was filled with this rope that he had brought with him so in case he could kill himself. So basically Antasi was for him the last try to find meaning in his life and if I'm leaving untidy I can use this rope to hang myself so in my case it was never that serious and I also had the feeling that I wasn't so desperate that I want to die tonight for example I, I always had this feeling well if it gets really bad I can still kill myself tomorrow um, it wasn't so bad and well honestly probably I didn't really want to die um, I mean if I really had wanted to die I could have stopped breathing and 10 minutes 15 minutes probably would have been enough to die but well interestingly among those People that commit suicide, um, I don't know the present number in Germany. When I was young, it used to be about 10,000 people a year. In, J in, in Japan, for a long time, it was more than 30,000 um, people. In Japan, the suicide rate was very high. It's getting 
a little bit lower now, but, but it's still pretty high. But nobody commits suicide by stopping to breathe. People jump off buildings, they jump in front of trains, they hang themselves, they take uh, medicine. Um, in other countries where it's easy to get a gun, you shoot yourself. Sometimes people first, they shoot their neighbors and then they shoot themselves or their family and then they shoot themselves. Um, but nobody just stops breathing. Probably the, the reason is very easy because the part of us that wants to die is, is up here. Um, but the rest of the body doesn't want to die. So we somehow have to kill our body to die. We cannot just kind of say, well, I don't want to live anymore, so I stop breathing. So there's at least two parts involved. And one of part of us wants to die, and this part has to kill the other part that doesn't want to die. Um, meaning of life. Uh, getting back to the question of meaning of life. Why wouldn't I want to commit suicide then if there's no meaning to life? Well, one part of the answer is this. Well, why then not stop breathing? Or on the other hand, if you cannot just stop breathing, why is that? Because your body wants to live and your body doesn't need meaning to live. Your brain always thinks about, well, what's the meaning to this? What's the meaning to that? What's the meaning to that? But actually, well, do you need a meaning to live? And the answer is no. No. Your lungs are perfectly fine with taking one breath at a time. And they don't ask themselves, what's the meaning to breathing? I'm going to be dead in 100 <coughs> years anyway. What's a waste of energy to, to breathe or, or the heart? Well, why would I pump all this blood through this body if it's going to die anyway? The heart doesn't need a meaning for beating. For some reason, <coughs> our brain always thinks it needs a meaning to do things. まあ、あの人生の意味の簡単な答えは意味がないということですね。え、いくら頑張っての部屋はそうもらったとしても、最終的には意味がない。まあ、だから自殺したって全然構わない。むしろ人口が助かるあの人類が地球人類はむしろそれで助かるから本当に死にたければ死んだらいいんだけれども本当に死にたいかどうか頭の中でそう考えているだけじゃないか本当に死にたいならば
は死にたいと思っても首より下は死にたくない。人生の意味はないけれども首より下は別に意味というものを必要としてない。意味を必要としているのは意味が知りたい。意味がなくては困ると思っているのは、まあ、頭くらい。だけれども、じゃなくたっていいじゃないか。内山老師の証言で言えば、この頭を手放しにしたら、別に人生の意味なんてなくたっていい。意味があるからこそ生きるんではない。切ることに意味はないんだけれども、うん、特になくたっていい。A little bit more complicated answer、um, would be the answer that there is no meaning to life, but you can give meaning to your life.、Um, that answer is,、uh, for example,、um, you can find it among others in the books of. Uh, Viktor Frankl, the most famous in English one is called、uh, Men's Search for Meaning.、Um, in German, what is it in German? Und trotzdem ja zum Leben sagen, which is a little bit strange title for the book because,、uh, well, in English that would be and still saying yes to life. Um, but that is not the original title of this book that I'm talking about, but it's the title of a lecture that Frankl gave later in his life. But the lecture itself is not part of the book, so it's strange that they would、um, use the title of a lecture for a book that has a Quite different content. Either way,、um, in Japanese, the title would be Yolu Tokiri, which means Night in Frock.、Uh, frock. Um, that's his most famous work in which、uh, Frankl, who was a Jew who lived in Austria、uh, during the Nazi time,、uh, describes his experiences in concentration camps, which he survived, but the rest of his family was killed. And、uh, he originally was and later became again a, a psycho. How do you say? Psychiatrist. Psychiatrist.、Um, and he started something which is called logotherapy. So basically, therapy through meaning. Logo means meaning, logos means meaning. So uh, he uh, tried to help people find. Meaning in life, and by finding, he means not that there is already a meaning and you just have to look for it to find it, but basically,、um, one famous thing that、uh, Frankl says is you shouldn't ask life for its meaning, but it's life that is asking you for the meaning. You're the one who has to give meaning to life. It's not that you sit here and say, well, what's, what's the meaning to life? And if there's no meaning, why, why do I live? Why don't I kill myself?、It's、basically, life is giving you this question what, what's the meaning to your life? That connects to this question about kind of adult practice. The, the, the childish attitude would be to expect somebody to give you meaning in your life. And if there's no meaning, well, why should I live in the first place?、Um, the adult. Point of view would be well, if there's no meaning to life, maybe I can still try to live a mini- meaningful way of life. And Frankl said, well, there's, there's three uh, examples uh, how you could give meaning to your life. One would be to create something, for example, a piece of art, a piece of music, to write a novel,、um, or to maybe just.、Uh, Have a garden in the back of your house or, or something like that. It doesn't really have to be something big. You, do, you create something, and sometimes <laughs> when you create something, you feel that that gives meaning to your life. It makes you feel that something meaningful is happening there when you create something.、Um, 
But of course, not everybody is an artist like Picasso. Uh, some people, they have something like that in them, others have not. And then so, uh, Frankel says, well, another thing you can do is, uh, for example, uh, experience and enjoy, for example, works of art or music or landscape. You go into nature um, or you travel around the world and just see things and see beautiful things. Or maybe you're gourmet and you love to eat delicious things. And that makes you feel at the end of the day, if you ate something that was good. It makes maybe things makes you think that this day was meaningful because um, you discovered a new taste. You ate something delicious. That would be also a way to give meaning to your life by just discover, experience, enjoy things uh, in life. And the third thing is that sometimes you can't even do that. For example, in Frankl's case, when he was in the concentration camp, uh, enjoying life or the delicious food or traveling around the world, that was just not an option. Creating artworks was not an option. Um, for him, every day in the concentration camp was just suffering. And it could be the same when, for example, you are diagnosed with terminal cancer and you are hospitalized and you're already lying on the bed and you don't know when you're going to die, but you're basically only suffering and waiting for the day for you to die. And even just experiencing or enjoying uh, life is not an option anymore. In that case, Frankl says, suffering itself can be a way to give meaning to your life, which sounds a little bit, well, paradoxical maybe to some, but he say, if you just take this suffering at face value and, well, I would put it like this, um, if you don't suffer here, right now in this moment if you don't accept that suffering and live that suffering nobody can do it for you so you take that suffering and well it's not that you have to enjoy it but you taste it you taste the, the whole flavor of this suffering and even that can give meaning to your life. Um, but if you're a really nihilistic person, probably you could still counter um, this approach by saying, well, but for example, creating artwork, what, what's the meaning of creating artwork? What's the meaning of creating pieces of music? What's the meaning of giving your life a meaning? Um, what's the meaning of uh, enjoying this day if maybe tomorrow I'm dead? So I think this approach by Frankl um, requires our willingness to, to actually, how do you say, choose life. So this, this giving life a meaning, it doesn't create a meaning that would... <clears throat> Mm, survive the first challenge like for example money doesn't have a meaning because when you're dead you can't take your money with you sex doesn't have a meaning because when you're dead nobody asks you how many girls you slept with <laughs> um, but I mean the same you could say about artworks when you're dead nobody asks how much artworks you create uh, nobody asks, asks how delicious foods you ate or how many countries you travel to nobody even asks you how much suffering you took upon you. Um, it only works in that moment when you, well, accept that, well, I can live this day or I don't live this day. And giving meaning to your life in this second sense, the more complicated sense, basically means that you accept this one day and you try to make the best out of it. Not because it doesn't, it has a meaning, but you accept it and you try to make the best out of it, live it to the full. And that is what Frankl would say, creating 
meaning, giving meaning to that one bit. でまああの人生に意味はないんだけれども、ヴィクトル・フランクルという人がいます。日本では特に夜と霧という本で有名です。それでも人生にイエスという別の本もありますけれども、このフランクルに夜と人生にあらかじめ意味というものが用意されたのではなくて、むしろ私たちが人生に意味を与えなければいけない。自分の人生に意味を与えない限りは、人生には本当に意味がない。だから人生に向かって、その意味は何ですかと問うべきではなく、むしろ私が人生に問われている。お前の生き方にどんな意味があるかと、人生の方から問われているのは自分だというのは、まあ、フランクルの。出張ですで自分の人生に意味が与えるには、まあ、例えば3つがあるとフランクが言います。1つは、えー、想像すること。芸術作品とか音楽だとか、まあ、料理もそうだし、禅、えー、ガールのようなところを想像したり、それに意味を見出す人もいる。そういう能力とか趣味がない人は自分では想像できないけれども、人が想像したものを楽しむことはできる。おいしいものを食べることもそうだし、えー、きれいな音楽を聴く美しい作品を見るあるいはきれいな景色を見る旅をする、えー、それも人生に意味を与える一つの方法ところがあのフランクルという人は、えー、ユダヤ人でオーストリアに生まれてナチ,ドイツナチスドイツの人に時に精神科医をやった人ですけれどもナチスドイツの時に強制し収容所に入れられて、確かにアウシュビッツも一時期出たと思いますけれども、結局生き延びたけれども、家族は、残りの家族は全部殺されてしまったんですね。で、この頃は、もちろん想像する活動は全くできないし、人が想像したものを楽しむということも全くない。一日一日ただ苦痛に耐えるだけだったと思うんですけれども、えー、今だったら、例えば、末期がんでもういつ死ぬかわからない、えー、もう入院して、薬を、まあ、投入されるけれども、やはり毎日毎日が苦しい。痛みに耐えて死ぬのを待つだけという人もいる。そういう人にどういう生きる意味はあるんだろうというと、フランクが言うには苦しむことも、苦しむことによって、この苦しみをそのまま受け入れることによって、自分の人生に意味を与えることができると。極端な場合は、苦しみそのもの、この苦しみを、そのまま受け入れるという生き方によって意味を見出すこともできる。それこそ、まあ、それでも人生にイエスという態度ですね。それでも人生にイエスという。別にジェスイエスと言わなければいけないという理由は一つもない。生まれた意味もなければ死ぬまでの78年、90年の時間に意味がないんだから、ノーと言ったっていいし、自殺して言ったっていいけれども、それをしないんだったら、イエスと言わなければ、それこそまあ意味のない生き方になってしまうんですね。生きるならば、それこそイエス。そしてそれは楽しい部分だけにイエスを言うんではなくて苦しいところにもイエスと言わなければ苦しい日雨の日つらい日うつの日に意味がなくなってしまうでもそういう日もそのまま受け入れるまあそれによって meaning of life を見つけることができるかもしれない Then there was this question about quitting the game, game or little koto ni tsuite. That's an expression that I've been using more often recently. 
Um, what does it mean to quit the game? What do I mean with the game in the first place? Um, I'm not an expert in psychology, but... Um, well, around... When kids around one year old, they say the first kind of words, but you can't really say, call it speaking yet. But then when they get two years old, three years old, um, they learn to speak. And they need some time until they learn, well, who they are. Um, interestingly, at first, when kids learn to speak, they don't, they don't know how to use the words I and you. Um, so first, when they refer to themselves, they use their name, the name that has been given to them by their parents. Um, for some reason, I don't know, <clears throat> what the reason could be but uh, for some reason in japan kids much longer keep that habit of referring to themselves as for example talo if their name is talo uh, they call themselves talo for a longer time than in the west in the west also kids if their kid if this name is john for example he would call himself john but then he learns quicker to refer to himself as i why in Japan, sometimes it's the parents who try to motivate the kids to refer to himself with the first pronoun, uh, singular. By, for example, calling a kid, uh, male persons in Japan often call, say, boku, when they say I. For some reasons, females don't use that word. But boys and also often uh, grown-up men, when they refer to themselves, they say boku. So the parents call their boy boku although that's absurd because boku means me but, but to motivate the kid to say boku uh, they say boku but then anyway at one point you learn that and when you're three four five years old you learn to say for example in japan the girls would say watashi the boys would say boku in the west we say i and you um, and at that point you're already part of the game and nobody probably really remembers what happens before you're able to speak at least I don't have any memories from when I was two years old sometimes there's people who claim that they remember when they were born or when they were still in their mother's belly or past lives or stuff like that i don't know if that's really true but uh, probably for most of us uh, we only have memories since after we learn to speak because well memory probably consists of either language or of images or other stuff but your mind needs to become able to form concepts, make pictures, um, or to use one another metaphor except for game like do you, you map reality. You need to be able to picture a map of reality and also locate yourself on that map. So basically becoming able to speak means to you you picture you make a picture of reality a map of reality and also you know where you are on that map so you can say i you know who is at the center of the map um so that's first of all the the kind of the the basic requirement for be becoming part of the game you need to be able to make that map and all of us become able to do that at a very young age um, and probably in the beginning it's a shock when you realize you're not the only player in that game but there's other players until then whenever you cry um, your mother gives you milk and uh, or she sh changes the diapers um, so during the first year or so, 
probably there's no distinction between yourself and others and you can hardly move your body your body and your hands you can't really use them at your will and your feet um, but when you are hungry and you cry your mother comes so it's probably you have the illusion that actually the mother is, is part of yourself uh, even more than these hands and feet maybe but at one point and that must come as a shock you realize actually my mother is also just a human being and she's sometimes tired she's sometimes angry and then maybe you have other brothers and sisters and you realize actually i'm only a part of this game a small part of this game and um the other players for them it's actually not about me like until then you thought the whole game is about you but then you realize actually i'm only one of uh, many players and for the others it's not about me um in the end everybody is most concerned about themselves And well, the parents are also concerned about their children, but that's also, well, why is that? In part, it's also because you think about the children as an extension of yourself and you hope that they might realize all the dreams that you didn't realize. So it's not really unconditional love in most cases. When parents love their children, they do love them, but it's not so unconditional. Um, and when you realize that also that comes as a shock that my parents didn't really love me for what I am but more for what they wanted me to be what they hope uh, I will grow into but maybe I don't really want to grow into that I don't want to be that what they want me to be um, so playing the game basically means you well you learn that you need to do your homework to get pocket money and you want pocket money to buy sweets and pocket books and games and stuff like that uh, you learn how to well play the game uh, to get that and you learn also that there's other players and you need to respect these other players to a certain degree so that they help you to win as well but basically in the end at the end of the day it's only about the points that you gain you want to gain points you want to win the game you want to make the high score if possible and uh, later in life you always compare yourself with the others how am i at school compared to the others how am i with the girls compared to the others uh, I'm driving a BMW. What are the others driving? I'm living in this house. <laughs> what are the others? Um, that's basically the game. Um, and the reason why I'm talking about quitting the game is because when you play the game, you, well, you forget something one thing and that has also to do with the meaning of life well the game is going to be over in 100 years probably earlier what do you do with your high school score what do you do with all these points that you made and another thing that you forget is this day that you're living today you can't compare it to the day others live or one hour of zazen when it comes to the posture you can compare your posture to your neighbor's posture or you can maybe compare how often you sleep during zazen to the neighbor and you maybe feel good well, um, i'm not moving as much as if i'm better than if <laughs> um, but what actually happens during that one hour this one hour this reality of one hour how do you compare that to anything i mean there's no comparison possible the reality of your life cannot be compared to anything 
Um, so for example, there was the map metaphor. You're living inside the map and you locate yourself in the map when in reality, of course, the map is here. For, for if I had, well, I have a map, for example, on my iPad. I have Google Maps on my iPad and I could on Google Maps see where I am on the map. I'm in Antaiji. Antaiji is in Hyogo Prefecture. Hyogo Prefecture is in Japan and Japan is on the planet Earth. So is this where I am? No. I am here and the map is part of the reality here. But that's what we forget when we play the game. We start to locate ourselves on a map that we created in reality and we forget the reality that we have to be in to make a map out of it. And at one point we start to see the map only. We see the game only and we only take keep track of the, our score. And that's the only thing we're worried about. Um, or another very popular metaphor would be the movie. And originally you were everything in that movie but then you realize well that is i'm seeing the world through the eyes of the main actor i'm the main actor in this movie um, and rather than enjoying the whole movie you try to be better than the other actors you you think it's only about what happens to the main actor you're living at one point you live inside the movie and you forgot, forget completely about the whole screen that you were before. You identified with the main actor. In the case of the map, you forget the reality that the map is made of. And you think that you is something that you can find on the map when you originally were the reality. You were not separate from the rea reality that you needed for creating the map. So that's what I mean by quitting the game. And in Uchiyama Roshi's books, it would be, well, these two meanings of self. One is the self that is one out of seven billion people on this planet. And the other self is, well, everything, everything that happens in this moment. And playing the game means to identify only with this one player that is one out of seven billion. Um, quitting the game means to wake up that, well, actually, everything, everything that's happening right now is me and there's no comparison because how do I compare this to anything else? Practice in daily life um, is connected to quitting the game because and also connected to the next question, what does it mean to be a monk? Um, in daily life, we have to play the game to a certain degree. Otherwise, we couldn't survive. We need money, we need a house to live in, we need food to eat. Um, it's not that you need a family and you need kids, but maybe you want to have a family and kids. And if you have a family, then you need to support uh, the family. Um, so practicing in daily life, especially when you're not a monk, <coughs> but a lay person, in a way contradicts quitting the game. You cannot. 100% quit the game. If you have a job, um, you have to, well, compete with others. You want to make a career. Um, quitting the game might not really be an option there. 
or maybe first I go to this question, what does it mean to be a monk? Um, well, the reason why people choose monkhood, I think, is because it makes it much easier to quit the game, at least for some time. Like here in Antaiji, you paid uh, to participate in the retreat, but if you come long term, you don't have to pay. So you don't need any money. That aspect, which is a big aspect, a big part of playing the game, is gone. So at the end of the month, there are no bills to pay. You don't have to uh, file any tax paying documents at the end of the year. You just sign a paper that says no income. And that's it. You pay no, no taxes as a monk. Um, 1,800 hours, hours during the year, you just sit. And sitting is basically the perfect example of quitting the game. Because what is this then good for? It's good for nothing. And that's why we do it. Because it's, it's the most radical example of not participating in the game. Uh, we are not even practicing mindfulness in the hope that it helps us later when we get back to so-called real life. Uh, we don't hope that we might have good ideas coming up during meditation and that we can met, make money out of those ideas later. We don't hope that it might expe uh, extend our life expectancy. One hour of Zazen is just one hour of just sitting, quitting the game. And becoming a monk enables you to do that. <clears throat> Mm, at least here in Antaiji you can do that. Although also in Antaiji it's not the whole story. So <clears throat> uh, Antaiji also has a daily life. And there's also this aspect, for example, we have this electric fence and it needs to be checked daily. And what you check there is basically um, sometimes uh, in the wind and rain, um, it happens that these electric wires move a little bit and they start to touch uh, the poles of the fence. And then uh, the, how do you say, uh, the electricity escapes from there. Um, the voltage goes down and the electric fence doesn't work anymore, doesn't keep the deer and the boars out. So somebody has to check the fence and they have to take a good look at the wires and make sure that they will see if there's a problem. Or so. Sometimes you check the voltage and you realize for some reason in some part there's low voltage. And you have to think about why. Why could it be that there's no low voltage? You have to find the reason uh, why the voltage is low on certain days. And if you Remember that Zen practice is supposed to be quitting the game. You could say, well, why do we have to do that? Why do we have to do that? Is it really so important? Why don't we use this time to do the Zen? Um, the answer why it's important is because we try to be self-sufficient. If the deer or boars get into the vegetable fields, we have nothing to eat in the autumn and during the winter. But again, you could say, well, is that really so important? If the deer and the boar get into the garden, the vegetable garden, good for them. They're also hungry. And if we have nothing to eat, we can go to town and back and people will give us something. It will be enough to survive. Isn't it about getting out of this game of gaining? I want the potatoes for myself. I don't want the, the boars to eat the potatoes. Isn't that also playing the game? And in a way, you could say, yes, it's also playing the game to a certain degree. So in Antaiji... There's these two sides, 1,800 hours of just doing nothing and just sitting and stopping the game. And if we wanted to, we could do a lot of more productive things during that time. If we wanted to be professional farmers and sell foodstuff, 
we maybe could be successful if we worked from four in the morning until eight at night uh, using this zazen time in a more productive way but we don't but then when we work we try to do what's necessary to do so actually being a monk doesn't mean that you quit the game 100%, but you're still part of the game. You try to be serious about what you do, which in Antaji means uh, you try to grow your own rice, your own vegetables. We fell trees and chop those so that we have hot bath, hot shower. But it's not about competition. So at the end of the day, it's not about who worked most. It's not about who's the best cook, who chopped the most wood, and who chopped the most wood is allowed to have one side dish more than the others. We don't play the game in that way. Uh, it's also not that you make a career as a monk faster if you're better than the others. And so to me, being a monk doesn't mean that you quit the game completely, but you play it in a little different way. It's not about you, it's not about your points, but you try to cooperate with the others uh, in the game. And if you have an environment like Antaj, it's more easy than in so-called real life, in real society. But practice in daily life with others, I think what you can and should aim at in what you can and should aim at in life and society is basically the same. Change the game just as much as you can like for example you play monopoly with your kids and the aim of monopoly is to be the richest man at the end of the game um, if you play with your kids and you know the rules of monopoly well and they don't they might be quite easy for you to win each time so is it the aim and the meaning of monopoly to win each time against your kids obviously not um, the same with chess or, or go or whatever game um, when you play with your kids you want them to have fun as well you want them to discover the fun of playing the game if they don't, they won't play with you anymore and it's no fun for you either. So um, when you play, most of the time it's not really about the points you make and if you win at the end or not. It's about the fun that all sides have. And... Uh, the amount that all sides can enjoy that game so sometimes you will maybe even consciously choose to lose that game to allow the others to have more fun at the game but then when your kids grow and maybe they have smaller siblings um, you probably will also hope that they won't always try to win, win, win. Once they discover the joy of winning the game and being part of the game, uh, at first you help them to learn that. Oh, that's really... It's fun and it's a joy to win this game. At first it's hard, especially with something uh, difficult like chess. But then, first time they win against daddy and they're really proud. Wow, I won against daddy. But then they play with their small brother or their small sister and you try to teach them another step, which means now you know how to win, but also now teach your smaller sister, your smaller brother, the joy of playing the game. It's actually not about winning in the first place, it's about having fun together. 
And living our lives in that way in daily life is very difficult but not impossible. And uh, that's what in Buddhism is called uh, the life of, of a bodhisattva. Mm -hmm. And usually the first step is said to be giving. Usually what we are thinking about in our lives first is how, what can I get? How much can I take? How much will people give me? And as a bodhisattva, yeah, we change that rule and say, why don't I give? I can give. Um, sometimes when I have a fight with my wife at night and then the next morning, the fight is already over. We can hardly remember what we are fighting about. But then sometimes it's about who's going to say good morning first. <laughs> Because somehow you still think I was I was right, she was wrong. I don't even remember what the fight was about, but, but she owes me an apology. And probably she thinks the same way. So <laughs> we're both waiting for who's going to say good morning first. We don't even have to apologize. I just want you to say good morning first. <laughs> and that's also, I mean, that's the, the, the game of the stupid person. A stupid person's <laughs> game. But, well, even I, after 30 years of Zazen, I'm still part of that game. And <laughs> quitting the game means you just say good morning. You just say good morning. It's as easy as that. And in Aitaji, it's easy because Jorgensen is going to be this month the guy who says good morning and you just have to answer. It's, it's really easy in an environment like this. But if you're married and you sometimes have a fight with your spouse, um, even that can be difficult but there's an opportunity for pl to play the bodhisattva even though you think you were right and the other person owes you an apology you say good morning how are you <laughs> it's as easy as that practice in daily life but well in theory and in practice often it's not so easy what does it mean to be a monk i try to answer that uh, monk being a monk makes it just a little bit easier to play the game with different rules because well it's untidy living at untidy is like playing monopoly among kids the rules are just a little bit easier um, no money involved there's a futon for you and if you don't have clothes there's stuff in the futon beer we have rubber boots for people who come here um, Although the last couple of years we've become more strict. Like when I first became the abbot here, people could come anytime they wanted. There was no age uh, restriction. Uh, my first couple of students, they were all older than me. My first student was 69 years old when, when he ordained here as a monk. And uh, at some times I was the youngest when I became the abbot. 33 it's sometimes I was the youngest among the residents everybody else was older than me a lot of people didn't speak any Japanese uh, when they came and also there was no commitment required now we say you should commit for three years when you come or at least think about seriously think about staying for three years in the beginning you could stay for two days or two months or two years just as you wanted as you chose as you felt um, and when people came, they didn't have to pay either, so no money. If you wanted to donate, you were welcome to donate, but you didn't have to pay. Um, which meant that, well, sometimes people came, showed up unannounced on the doorstep. They had maybe heard from somebody or there's displayed displayed, you don't have to pay, so if you run out of money, you can go there, backpackers. <laughs> And maybe they had two more months until their flight goes to India, so they had to somehow survive for two months in, in Japan. It's an expensive country. So, oh, in Antaji, I get this uh, vegetarian food, and, and it's in nature. It's a beautiful place. They even have Wi-Fi connection. <laughs> um, and at the time, it's basically also part of kind of playing the game with different rules. When these people come, okay, here's your futon and here's how we eat the meals and the bath time is at this time and please help us with this work 
And if then after a week or two weeks they said, okay, thank you for all, and they left, and sometimes they even leave with their room complete mess and, and the sheets are dirty and, and they don't wash their working clothes, then, well, okay, we do that. We wash the, the rooms and we prepare, we clean the rooms and we prepare for the next person. Uh, but, uh, well, the reason why I'm not now stricter is just like you teach your kids to have fun at the game by sometimes losing, but then you also want your kid to get to that point. So if you really want others also to become bodhisattvas, uh, you have to also communicate, well, it takes, it takes a certain commitment and you also have to do something. For example, also language requirements. Um, you do not have to speak Japanese to study Zen, but if you're living in a community like this, you have to be able to communicate with the others. That has to be some language, could be Japanese, could be English, could be German. But if it's in Japan, then there will always be a high percentage of Japanese here. There will be visitors coming from the village. They speak no English. There will be telephone calls. And the people who call here, they expect somebody who speaks Japanese to answer. So it would be kind of selfish if people come here and say, well, I speak English well. If you want to communicate with them, English is the world language. Why don't you speak English with me? What happens if you are in the kitchen and the telephone rings and you're the one who needs to answer the telephone? So the last couple of years we've become more strict, but in my mind that's just like teaching a kid when they're 10 years old that they should also be able to take care of others when they play with something, somebody who's still five years old. Then now you need to lose and you have to... It's not about you anymore um, you need to be able to lose you so ba basically what a bodhisattva tries to do is you try to help others but what do you try to help them you try to help others to become bodhisattvas as well that's basically the aim you don't want to help eternally always just feeding the hungry and giving clothes to the cold ones you also try to do that, but the hope is that they then realize, wow, wow, there's somebody playing with completely different rules. There's somebody who's quit the game, and maybe I could do the same. In, at first, they think, oh, that guy must be foolish. He's giving away his points. He's giving away his money. Let me get that money. Let me get those points. Let me take advantage of that person. But the hope always is that at one point, the people around you realize, oh, maybe there's a deeper reason to that. And they discover that, oh, I've been absorbed in this game for half of my life. But if that guy was able to quit it, maybe I can quit it. What does it mean to be a monk? So basically, in my mind, it's somebody who has quit the game but then participates again, but he plays according to different rules. So it's not that you excuse yourself from the game and say, I don't partake in this game anymore. But rather you play the game, but you play it in a different way in the hope that it's more fun for everybody involved. What to do about judging? How can you practice as an adult? How to do about judging? Um, like in my metaphor that I always use, um, the metaphor of the meadow during the Zen. During the Zen, uh, you realize that on the meadow of your mind there's so many sheep. There's black ones, white ones. You try to separate them. That's judging. The shepherd is, is judging. <clears throat> you decide that the sheep are not supposed to be in the vegetable garden, so you build a fence around the sheep. and Make sure that they don't get out of the 
fence. That's also the shepherd who's doing his judging and is trying to exert control there. And what I told you, uh, don't identify with the shepherd. Mm. Don't be the shatter, try to be the sky first. Be like the sky that spreads above the meadow. You see what's happening on the meadow, but you don't judge. You don't control. That doesn't mean that you have to erase the shepherd. So when you become able to be the sky, the shepherd is still there. The shepherd is still down there. But so you also, you even allow the shepherd to play his game. You allow the sheep to be there. You even accept the shepherd. So if you use the word, if we use the word judging here, you don't judge the judging. You don't say judging is a bad thing. So now I need to stop judging. If you do that, you're judging again. You realize I'm judging and you don't judge the judging. You don't say judging is a bad thing. But if you become able to just see that it's happening and that is really not based on much anything basically when you're judging you're on the map but the map is not connected with reality or it's only loosely connected when you realize that the judging loses its kind of power supply if you really engage positively in the judging then you're supplying it with more energy and it never stops and even when you say judging is a bad thing you're doing even more you're still doing more judging so you don't stop the judging but if you just see the judging for what it is then just with the sheep becoming quieter over time i think you get free from judging You see other people judging a lot. You even witness that it's happening in yourself. And you don't even say that's a bad thing or that's a stupid thing. You just see that's the way it is. That's the way it is. But reality cannot be forced into that frame of judging like the sheep cannot be forced into that fence that the shepherd builds. And even if you think you finally separated the black ones from the white ones, you will always find a couple of gray ones and you're not quite sure are these white ones, are these black ones. And when you're still thinking about it behind your back, the black ones and the white ones have mingled again. So it's never going to stop so first thing to stop is stop the judging stop the judging and when it happens don't engage in it how can you practice as an adult practicing as an adult自分の人生であるというまあ気づきから出発しないといけないと思いますね。たとえ親でも配偶者でも子供でも自分の代わりには慣れない。あるいはまああの先ここ言ったようにこういうみんなが励んでるような特徴に来たら自分も少し頑張
でもまあ悪いがみんなやめたとしてもまあその時やめれたとしてもここ一歩出れたら元の木阿弥だからあまり意味がないだから最終的にはお前が吸いたいなら吸ったらいいしやめたければやめたらいいというやめるならもう自分がやめるしかしょうがない頑張りたいんだったらもうがん自分が頑張るしかしょうがないし頑張,ら頑張らなくてもいいやと思ったら頑張らなければいいんだけれどもまず人に頑張ってもらって自分はその後をついていこうという、うん、甘えた考え方は、うんまあ、通用しないということを本当に実感する。うんこの今日というたった一日だって、周りの人は何をしようが、あるいはまあ一通の座禅もそうですけれども、いくら周りの人が頑張って座禅したって、それは自分の座禅に絶対なりえない。そしてもう70、80で終わってしまう人生だけじゃなくて、この1日だって絶対に戻ってこない1日。明日まあ 10, 10回座ります。おそらく途中から早く終わればいいのに、早く、早く終わってくれないか、早く終わってくれないかと思うかもしれないけど、もう終わってしまえば、この十中の座禅は絶対戻ってこないし、そのうちの1回、一回の座禅ももう一回やり直しさせてくれと思ったって絶対にやり直しが効かないだからそれを自分でもう本当に最善に生かすか殺すか全部自分一人にかかっているということもちろんまあその修行道場だったら修行仲間の価値もこれはすごい価値ですし、あの、同志という、要するに同じ志を持ったものは、まあ、すごく価値のあるものなんだけれども、最終的にはもう自分一人で行くしかしょうがない。まあ、お釈迦様だってよりどころは自分だけで一人で歩め、才能、角のごとし一人で歩めと。いうわけですねあのこの仏道の場合だって同じです。最初は入門したら良き先輩、良き仲間がいるとすごい力になるんだけれども、まあ、安泰寺もそうだし、大体どこのもそうだけど、5年もいればもう自分一人、もう同業者いなくなってしまう。おそらく永平寺ですら、もう5年もいればもう同業者がみんなどこか行ってしまって。でその時も自分の足で自分が歩まなければいけないしそれはもう哲学の世界だってどこの世界でもそうだし<笑>哲学でなんか周りになんかすごく深く考えてる人がいれば自分も深く考えられるようにはならないしグループ作業じゃない。仏道修行もまあ三が総理はすごく大事なんだけれども結局自分自分の道を自分の足で自分が歩む、うん、やらなければ損するのは自分、うん、別にご先祖様に申し訳ないとか親に申し訳ないとかそんな考えなくてもいいただ自分自身に申し訳ないと思わなければいけないんですね。うん、How to deal with pain? So that's a question that you will find yourself confronted with tomorrow.、Um, 
I already said in the afternoon um, we will be sitting 10 times. The first is one hour from 4 to 5 and then there's 15 minutes Kin Hin followed by 45 minutes of Zazen and there's going to be 10 periods of Zazen. Uh, from the time the bell strikes at the beginning of Sazen until the end of Sazen, uh, don't move. If you feel an itch, don't scratch yourself. Uh, if the glasses on your nose feel uncomfortable, let them sit on your nose. Um, but probably bigger problem than that are the pain in the knees and in the ankles and maybe in your back and shoulders as well what do you do with that pain you're not supposed to move well one thing you can do and i already told you that uh, if you know you can't sit in full lotus for 45 minutes don't start in full lotus if you know you can't sit in half lotus either for 45 minutes don't sit in half lotus if you can't sit in the burmese position either but you need a bench you can use a bench you can use a cushion under your buttock some people have also used chairs that's also possible to sit on a chair but and i've been seeing that a number of times Sometimes people decide to sit on a chair and after 15 minutes they start to move on the chair because they're in pain. People are miserable and in pain even on a chair. <laughs> you, I don't know, we never tried that, but we could try putting out a futon and allow them to lie on the <laughs> futon. I could imagine that after half an hour you, you start to feel pain on your back and your shoulders lying on the futon and, and you start to move around on the futon. So with pain there's well two aspects. One is the physical aspect and the other is the psychological aspect and often when you're in the pain you can't tell the, the one from the other you just feel pain but a huge part is psychological and if you know I can sit in Burmese for example for 45 minutes um, without it killing me you will still experience pain but then you can get let go of the whole rest of the pain which is psychological pain and there still might be pain but it's not so bad it doesn't kill you even though maybe at one point it feels like killing you i mean that's the story i always tell usually i say five day session on the third day it feels like you're dying and tomorrow it's going to be 10 hours but maybe even during the 10 hours after the third or fourth hour of sazen you feel like this is killing me and at one point I asked my teacher of always this, there's this invisible wall during session that doesn't let me through. At, at one point it feels like I'm dying. What can I do? And my teacher said, what are you worried about? We have a graveyard behind the, the Zen hall. And if you die, we can bury you there. <laughs> uh, it's really not a problem. It's not a problem for us here at Antaiji if you die. And even though I told you that I was thinking a lot about suicide when I was young, before I came to Antaiji, once you're in this situation that, oh, I'm in pain, this is killing me, it's killing me, it's killing me, you don't want to die. You realize you don't want to die. So what you do usually is, for example, if you're sitting somewhere close to Mjorgen, maybe you can take a peek on the watch and ah, it's, it's five minutes, five more minutes. I can, ah, I can grind my teeth and do that, for example. So if you know the time or maybe some people bring their clock, actually, that's not a good, good idea. If possible, don't bring your clock. But, but if you bring your clock and then you take a, take a look at the clock, oh, five more minutes. Um, <laughs> Maybe you start to count your breath, okay, one, two, and you count on the teller, oh, three more minutes, <laughs> two more minutes. 
<laughs> so you, you, you do this, trying to kind of, you, you don't want to move if the others are also not moving, so, so I don't want to be the first to move, and uh, you grind your teeth, you count the time, and then when the bell rings, ah, it's over. <laughs> But then you realize 15 minutes later, oh, I have to sit another <laughs> round of the Zen. But it works maybe in the beginning. So this this fighting attitude, I fight myself through the pain. And uh, sometimes it can even get you through the whole 10 hours <clears throat> if you're lucky. But uh, with a lot of people, they reach their limit after a time or you take a uh, look at, at Mjorgen's clock and you see, oh, it's still 30 minutes. <laughs> How can I sit with this pain for another 30 minutes? <laughs> three minutes! You thought it's three minutes and you see it's 30. It's, must be something wrong with the clock. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe the batteries are <laughs> dead or whatever. <laughs> but yeah, a couple of minutes later, you see it's still 29 minutes, 28 minutes. Can't be true. How can I survive this? Um, so you somehow, without anybody noticing, you kind of go, go a little bit like this and try to get the knees a little bit up. And sometimes it helps for a while when you sit like this. And then you, when this hurts as well, you go a little bit forward again. If you thought you could sit in half lotus, but you realized you can't do it in half lotus, you, you move a little bit here and try to get into quarter lotus. A quarter lotus, often your your uh, your ankles start to hurt even more. So so somehow you you try to sneak yourself through. You don't fight anymore, but but now you try to escape, just so that nobody notices, and and to try to escape. And when you fought yourself through the Zen, at the end you you say, "Wow, I did it! Wow, I did it!" And when you try to escape, in the end you feel not so good about yourself, but at least you survived. Um, usually these are the two approaches that we take first. First you try to fight and then next you try to flight. And the art of Zazen means to take none of these two approaches. So don't fight. It's not about fighting through Zazen, through the pain. You don't fight with the pain. But also you tr don't try to escape from the pain. But you well, you, it's not that you learn to enjoy the pain, but well, you accept the pain. You let the pain be. And if you learn to take the position of the sky and you realize I'm, I'm the sky, I'm not the shepherd, you might even have this feeling that there's the pain, but it's not my pain. I'm not the owner of the pain. So there's a pain there, but I don't suffer because there is nobody to suffer there. Might take some time to have this realization, but when you look at the pain only without, well, judging, for example, without judging the pain and saying, this is something bad for me, I need to avoid this. But you just allow this pain to be. And it's necessary, it's important for that that you know how you can sit for 45 minutes. So if you do that sitting in full lotus, when you can't sit for 45 minutes in full lotus, you can do damage to your body. So uh, by now probably you know if you can sit for 45 minutes in full lotus or half lotus or in Burmese. But if you know I can do that in Burmese, it's still painful, but it doesn't kill me. And then you allow the pain to just be. And even psychologically, when it feels like dying, and then you say, okay, then let me die here, and let's hope that Muho is going to bury me in the grave next to Sawaki Roshi and Uchiyama Roshi. Mm -hmm. Then you might realize, oh, it's actually easy, because the moment you thought you were dying, you lose this perspective of the, I'm suffering, I need to do something about it. There might still be pain, but... You don't do anything about it. You don't have to fight against it. You don't have to run away from it. And you realize, I'm still sitting here. Wow. Wow. After all, I'm still sitting here. And my knees hurt and the ankles hurt and the back hurts, but I'm still sitting here. 
So the less fighting you do and the less escaping you try to do, the easier it gets. Because by fighting and by trying to escape, you're basically multiplying the psychological part of the pain. Up to the point where you really think, I'm dying, I'm dying, it's killing me. When you're sitting on a soft cushion and you're protected from the rain and the wind and the tensors cooking for you while you're sitting there and you say, I'm dying, I'm dying, I'm in hell. And everything is actually taken care of. And once you let go, you realize, oh, actually I was quite over the top when I said I'm dying. How to teach those who are not interested in Buddhism? Mm. Well, the question is, of course, what do we want to teach them? There's no reason to teach anybody Buddhism who is not interested in Buddhism. But, I mean, what we try to teach is not Buddhism. What we try to teach others, that it's only a game. And it's possible to quit the game. It's possible to play the game with different rules. That's, of course, very difficult when you try to teach it to people who are so absorbed in the game that they still think it's only about the points I can make. And when people have a more easy approach to the game, then some people try to take advantage of that. If there's somebody who not, who, who's not thinking about winning all the time, well, then let me take his points. In that case, it can be actually quite difficult to communicate that uh, you have to decide by yourself well to what degree do I play the game then as if I would play with my three-year-old kids and I just allow them to win and I allow them to cheat um, and when they lose and they cry and they throw the game all over the place then I say okay okay let's start again and I give you an advantage but probably you don't want to play that game all the time. You don't want to allow the others to play the role of the three-year-old all the time. That's the, the reason why I, a couple of years ago at Antaji became a little bit tired of all the travelers who just came here because they could get a free ride in the summer. It was nice. And then when it got cold in the winter, everybody was going to India and Thailand. Uh, to smoke marijuana and then they came back in the spring maybe. <laughs> um, you do that for a while but also you can get tired of that. So, well, you have to be inventive teaching people. You don't have to teach people Buddhism but you might open, try to open their eyes that they are actually caught on a map when they don't see reality anymore. They've completely lost track of reality because they only move on the map in their minds. Um, helping people take a step back from the game. Often in life it's uh, things like sickness or case of death of a close one that teaches us that in a natural way. Oh, oh, this game has an end. And the way I played this game is pretty senseless when I think about the fact that it's going to end. Can you make others happy through your practice? Kono shugyo ni yotte, kono practice ni yotte, shito o shiawase ni dikiru ka tuyu. ことですね。
。ですから、まあ、内山老師が、おそらく、あの、毎回毎回、接しに来てた人、あの、その頃の京都の安泰寺には、えー、日曜日に、一日接しがあったと思いますけれども、月曜日から土曜日までは会社員として忙しく働いて、日曜日は家族を置いて、毎回毎回、座禅修行に来てた人に、まあその人が内山老師に自分はもう何年も座っているけれども、自分の修行が果たして進んでいるか進んでないか、自信がない。それをまあ判断してほしい。あるいは自分で判断するのにどう判断したらいいかという問いに対して内山老師は奥さんと子供に聞いてみる見ろと言ったんですねあの。一番よく見ている、君の修行の出来を一番よく見ているのは奥さんの子供だから自分の修行が進んだか進んでないか、それはまあお父さんが優しくなった、最近優しくなったなというならば修行が進んだ証拠になっている。そうじゃない。もうお父さんが最近もう座禅ばっかりして留守だし、帰ったらもうこちら全然向いてくれないと言うんだったら何のための修行かわからない。だから当然まあ修行によって周りの人にもっと幸せになってもらわなければいけない。つまり今までのゲームの仕方が変わらなければいけない。奥さんと喧嘩した時にはまずお前が悪いから謝れとじゃなくて自分の方から朝はおはようございますと言えるようになったら人を幸せにできるまあ手段にもなると思いますね自分の生き方自分の遊び方このゲームの遊び方は前と変わったなと今までは得したい得したい得したいとばっかり思った人はもっと太っ腹になってどうぞ私がおごるよとそういう生き方に変わったならば周りの人を幸せにすることはできるしまあ最終的な目的はただ周りの人をハッピーにするだけじゃなくて彼らもさらに周りの人をまたハッピーに生きるような人たちに育ってほしい。自分が一方的に幸せじゃないものをもっと幸せにするんじゃなくて、向こうの人も周りの人をハッピーに生きる人になってほしい。だからその自分が一人で違うルールでゲームをするんじゃなくて、みんなにもこういうルールがあるよと。みんなでこのルールでやったら、菩薩のルールでやったらもっと楽しいぞと。お前も菩薩の仲間になってくれと、まあ、まあ最初の第一歩それはこの大人の大人の修行の問いでもそうですけれども周りにまず一歩前に進んでもらって自分もするその後にするんじゃなくてまず自分が一歩進まなければ周りはついてこないけれどもこちらが何かをしてあげる向こうのためにしてもらおうあの向こうはしてもらっているではなくて一緒に菩薩の道を歩もう菩薩という全然違う義をやろうというそういうことだと思いますね。Can you make others happy through your practice? It depends on what you mean by happy, but basically my answer what, yeah, that's what I mean with quitting the game and then joining the game again but with different rules playing as a Bodhisattva should、um, also make the others around you happy. That's the story of a guy who came to Antaiji when Antai was still in Kyoto and Uchiyama Roshi was the abbot at the time, and they had the one day sessions every Sunday. So that person was working from Monday to Saturday, and on Sundays he would、uh, do the Zen and,、uh, while his wife and Kids were at home. And after a couple of years, he would ask Uchiyama Roshi, I'm not quite sure if I'm progressing in my practice. How can I judge if I'm making a progress or not? And Uchiyama Roshi said, You should ask your wife and kids. They know best about your practice. They know best if you make any progress or not. 
So if uh, through these years of practice, all these Sundays that you spend in Antas, you've become a more friendly dad at home, then your kids will be the first to realize that. If that's not the case, then there must be something wrong uh, with your practice. So if all of these hours of Zazen doesn't, don't help us to change the rules of the game we play and make the game as a whole more enjoyable for the other players, then we're doing something wrong. Is there rebirth? What about uh, Jinzu, uh, mystical powers? Mm. That's a difficult question if you think about it um, in terms of, well, what was Dogen Zenji's stance on rebirth? And because in, when he was young, he says, writes certain things that seem to contradict rebirth. Dogen Zenji wa genjoku wa no naka de wa maki ga moeta la hai ni natte shimau. De hai wa futatabi maki. に戻るという言葉はない。結構、まあ、愛称がいい考え方ですけれども、要するに体が滅びて脳みそも滅びれば、そこに意識だとか魂というようなものが残って、それが生まれ変わるというのを、弁当場で否定されるけれども、十二関門の道元禅師は、あの
du de Tanoske. Il cache de moi le nom de qui est le tombeau. Mais ce que là, c'est que Atta touche de moi. Conjo, nan tout cas, il quitte en dehors là, là, c'est mon nan tout cas n'a plus tombeau aussi. Moi aussi, n'a pas tout là, moi, ça, je crois, la monde est naïto, à ta chiva. Au mot. De moi, ma, ça qui est à yoni, là, c'est notre ami, ni, son mot, son mot, il quitte le vague de la vie, là, Atta là, ma. とくしたと思えばいいしなかったらなかったでもともとだと。うん、というのは私の考えですね。で、道元禅師もあれだけ矛盾したことを消防現像として残しているわけですから、そんなにこだわっていなかったんじゃないか。で、お釈迦様もこ
one thing which there's no doubt about is that I'm right here on this day as Muho on July 9th in Antaiji. And I'm trying to make the best out of that. I'm trying to live that day and this Muho to the full. And if tomorrow I should be here again as Muho on July 10th, I'm going to try and aim at the same. So the same with rebirth. If there's rebirth and after this person, Muho, dies, I should still be in the universe as somebody else. Maybe as some of you or in the more traditional Tibetan view as a future being that somehow karmatic through karma connected to this Muho. I'm going to try to make the best of that existence. And if I'm not reborn, even better, no problems, even better, even better. But the Theravadans would say, well, you need to attain Nirvana before that. <laughs> Only those, the Arhats, have the privilege to be not reborn. How can you expect to be erased from the universe just because Muho dies? I don't know. I don't know. I'm open both ways. No problems with rebirth, but also no problems with no rebirth. Uh, what about Jinsu, uh, mystical powers? え、ま、私はどちらかと言えば、この6人数に対してそういう不思議ななんか大虫に気を的な意味での人数には、ま、会議的というか、うん、嘘じゃないかなと。だから先生が記憶としてある。ま、嘘という証拠は私にはないけれ
but I wouldn't understand how you feel. What's the worth of that visual power? The, the real mystical power that if mystical powers are important in Buddhism, then it would be the mystical power to understand how somebody feels. That's what impo what's important, not to uh, know facts from past lives or to know the future, but to understand how the people feel that you live with, that you share your life with. Okay, so much from your side. If there's more questions or comments uh, from your side, please uh, ask. Ich habe eine Frage, aber ich möchte mich für morgen ausklinken. Ich bin morgen nicht dabei. Oh, okay. Danke. Ich bin auch da im Zimmer, oder? Oder machst du einen Spaziergang oder wie? Nein, ich werde so früh wie möglich abreisen, okay. um niemanden zu stören. Also, okay. Danke. Ja, ich bin auch da im Zimmer. Zu groß für mich. Die letzten Tage waren okay, waren okay. anstrengend genug, aber das ist äh, für mich too much. Okay. Weil ich, wie gesagt, hab, äh, sitze das erste Mal in Sasen mm -hmm. und dem her ähm, traue ich mir das nicht zu. Mm -hmm. Wie gesagt, ich möchte die ernsthaften Praktizierenden nicht stören und es würde meinerseits nicht kommen. kommen. Das habe hab ich bis jetzt. Und, ähm, ja. Das ist deine Entscheidung. Ja, genau. Mm. Also der erste Bus wäre um halb acht, ne? 7.30 Uhr. Der zweite Bus, Bus ist um neun. Von? Ähm, ah, das sind äh, dreieinhalb Kilometer, vier Kilometer von hier, dem Berg runter. Ne? Also nach zwei Kilometer kommt dieses Blockhaus, diese Blockhütte. Okay. Ja. Und da wird der Weg ein bisschen breiter. Und dann hast du nochmal zwei Kilometer und dann kommst du an die Straße. <lacht> da so eine kleine Kläranlage davor. Ähm, wenn du an die Straße kommst, wenn du genau hinschaust, auf der linken Seite ist so ein Bushalteschild. Mhm. Der Bus, der nach Hamasaka ist, der fährt aber auf der anderen Seite. Ne? Also halb acht. Halb acht ist der erste Bus. Ne? Okay. Ich möchte mich auch sehr bedanken. Ja, danke, dass du hier warst. Mhm. Und auch bei den Teilnehmern, die waren alle sehr sympathisch und nett. Aber wie gesagt, ich traue es mir nicht zu, nicht körperlich und nicht psychisch. Und von dem her, ähm, ja, danke trotzdem. Vielen Dank. Danke fürs Kommen. Und ja, noch gute Reise. Dankeschön. Ebenfalls. Wenigstens hast du ein Bad. Und wenigstens hast du das uns im Häuschen. Ja, genau. Das soll ich mal mitnehmen. Ja, und den Vortrag. Ja. Any other questions? Hoka ni shitsumon. Nado alimasenka. ま、前奏はこのよくやるんだけれども、一瞬今ここに引き戻されると思う。多分この2時間ずっと私のこれを聞いて、私のま、言ってる、喋ってる話の内容を理解しようと思ってたと思う。イファンさんはずっと意味の
Google Maps とか iPad とか iPhone も今ここにあるものだけれどもそれを見ている時は自分の心はもうこの今ここを忘れて今ここの中の別の地図の中に入っちゃおうでそういう意味ではもう今ここにいないということになってしまうもちろん首より下の体はいつも今ここだけれども、頭はそこから違う世界に入ろうとするから、お茶山老子は頭を手放せという。だから、座禅の時も、この痛いと感じたとしても、それを今、ここの現実として受けてもらって、そこから地図に逃げないように、マップの中に逃げないことが大事。So that was a question about the here and now. We're always in the here and now, but while we're in the here and now, we already have this map in our mind. And maybe some of you during these two hours were listening to me talking here and now, but you were thinking about the meaning. Does it mean this or maybe it doesn't mean that? So it takes place already on that map. And often Zen monks give these shouts, or sometimes not here in Antaiji, but in other monasteries, people were quite freewheeling with the slapping you in the face, for example. And I don't want to justify kind of violence in Zen monastic environment, but the good thing That happens when somebody flaps, slaps you in the face. In that moment, you return to the here and now. There's a, and for an instant, just like with a shout, you're here and now. And you don't think about the meaning. Maybe an instant later, two instants later, you think about, oh, what was the meaning of the shout? Or <laughs> there's the famous story of a master who cut off his student's finger and he got enlightened. But then maybe a week later, the student already thinks, oh, well, at least it's only my, my small finger, at least he didn't cut off my thumb. So then you're already in the game again, in the, in the map again. You're making comparisons, you're trying to make sense of it. But the moment somebody cuts off your finger, then you're in the here and now. Um, so there's nothing wrong with thinking and making maps but we should stay grounded in the reality that we are making the map of and that's the reason why zen masters always say you can't actually express it in words because word, words are part of the map the map is only there that supposed to help you ah there there was a question I forgot who asked me that question. Why do we study the Dharma when it's all about practice in the first place? So, so practice basically means to get back to the here and now. And you could compare it, for example, to climbing a mountain. And uh, if you want to climb a mountain, you have to put on your boots and to get out of the house and into the forest. Uh, the problem is that Although you can see the mountain clearly from here, once you're in the forest, you don't see the mountain top anymore. Maybe there's a river and you know, don't know how you can cross the river. So that's when you need a map. And that's the kind of the Dharma study we do here. We don't do Dharma study too often, but every five days uh, we do have a talk like this. And then during the winter, it's pr pretty intense. Why do we do that? Because you also need a certain grasp of the landscape and A certain amount of mapping isn't wrong. It's just that what can happen is that when you do too much of this, you only spend your time on the map and you compare this map with another map and you never put your boots on and you never get into the forest. And you might have a clear idea where the mountaintop is on your map, but you never get to the mountain. So, of course, Practicing is the most important thing. It's not about studying, but studying can help to clarify the direction where you're heading it or what we're trying to do here in the first place. But it doesn't replace what we're going to do tomorrow. 
when we're sitting on the cushion. And all what I said today about accepting the pain, um, I don't know how much use that will have for you tomorrow as a map. I hope it can give you some direction, but what's going to happen tomorrow on the cushion will be quite different from maybe what now you have on your map and you say, oh, that's okay, not fighting, not fleeing, just accepting the pain, dying on the cushion, I will do that. <laughs> <laughs> good, good luck. It's, it's, it's possible, it's possible, but it's, in reality it's something different than from what you imagine on the map. Any other questions? Hokanishi Simon. Alimasen ka. Hai, onegaishimasu. ですかね。うん。結局は自分一人なんだけど、もうザフに腰を下ろすまで。の道のりは結構長いと思いますね。あの、自分一人で座ってると、まずザフに座るまではたいへんだし、いざ座ったとしても まあそこでスマホがプルプルとなんかなったりとか雨が届いたとかいろんな邪魔が入って立ち上がっても誰も止めはしないだから、すぐ中断する十人で座った場合は結局自分の座禅そこは違わないけれどもザフまでの道のり
感じであれば、何でもどうぞ。No more questions. How to develop,、uh, how to develop uh, ji hi? Ji hi? Ji hi? Ji hi. Compassion? Yeah. And it, it, it,、mm. it, does it matter whether, de- whether to de- develop it or not?、Mm. If, if so, then how to?、Mm. Well, there's two approaches about compassion. Ji hi ni tsui de wa. あの2つのアプローチがありますけれども1つはもう積極的に慈悲の瞑想で座禅中に生きとし生けるものが幸せでありますようにと私も私に親しい家族もそして嫌なやつもみんな幸せでありますようにというのをまあ座禅をしながら心の中で祈るというアプローチですね。でも禅ではそれはあまりしない私もしない。私の場合は、それこそ死ぬかもしれないけれども、一度死んでみようと。初めて、まあ、その気になった時に、すごくまあ楽になったというか、新人脱落と言ったら大げさだけれども、ああ、これだったのか。道元禅師は仏の方より運ばれてというような表現をするけれども、座禅が座禅をする、こういうことだったのかと。ですごくまあ、ありがたいというか、感謝もするし、もったいない、もったいない。というような気持ちもそこであって、で、何か、要するに自分の力でそれに手に入れたんじゃなくて向こうから贈り物としてもらっちゃったようなそんな感じなので何かを返したい恩返ししたいという気持ちが普通にその後に出てきたそれまでは全くないでも少しそこで人にもそれを共有したいシェアしたいという気持ちはそこで少し出てきたんだよね慈悲自分は救われたそれまでは苦しい自殺するにも勇気がないでも生きるのも嫌だなというそんな何年数長かったけれどもありがたい今ここに自分が置かれて世界が開かれていることはありがたいでもおそらくかつての自分と同じようにまだ気づいてない人は多くいるんだろう。人にもそういう気づきを持ってほしい。まあそれは私は思う慈悲ですね。それが自然にその後芽生えてくると思いますね。About compassion, well, there's two approaches. One is to proactively during meditation hope for one's own happiness, but also the happiness of the family. The happiness of all living beings, including one's rivals and people one does not like. So one hopes for the happiness of even one's enemies, and that would be compassion. Or at first, maybe one chants these verses like a mantra and doesn't even really believe. That one wants one's enemies to be happy, but maybe one grows into that. But in Zen, usually we don't practice that kind of meditation.、Uh, from my experience, it's more like when you at one point get ready for letting go on the cushion, and even if it costs your life, you say, okay, then I'm gonna die here on the cushion. But then you don't die, but You're surprised that you're still alive. And in my case, until then, it was always like I don't have the courage to die. I'm not in a hurry to die, but I don't really want to live either. And then when I go through this like Hole of a needle where it's like, I don't want to die, I don't want to die, this is killing me, this is killing me. But then you let go, and wow, I'm still alive, and it's great, it's wonderful. 
And at that point, I felt that, oh, I need to give something back, something that I never felt before. Before, I always felt I'm entitled to more. I didn't ask to be born into this world. I didn't ask to be born as this muho. Uh, I didn't ask to be born into this time and age of human history. Um, people owe me something back for the fact that I'm born at this time as this person. When will I get my reimbursement for this flight that I never booked in the first place? And that changed when I realized, oh, it's, it's actually wonderful to be alive and I didn't do anything. I didn't do anything for this one day and I got it. I'm here on the cushion with the pain, but it doesn't even hurt so bad when you think about it. And that's the first time I thought, well, maybe I can help others who think the same way I thought until yesterday. So from my point of view, you don't have to artificially try to become a more compassionate person. But once you realize, wow, everything I have in this moment was given to me as a present. I didn't do anything for it. So maybe I shouldn't be so, how do you say, stingy uh, with what I have, with my money and with my time and with my even my body and mind. It's all given to me. So why don't I give a little bit to the others in the hope that they have the same realization? So that's my take on compassion. The other is that does it truly make better, or because you should, you should give it a try. You should give, yeah, yeah. I mean, that there's a lot of people who practice that, especially in Theravada tradition. But you can also try, in maybe even tomorrow if you feel really bad, and, and <laughs> maybe it takes your mind off the pain that. Mm -hmm. can pray for the happiness of all living beings, including your enemies. Um, uh, from your current explanation and your experience of the Zazen, and I know that there's no uh, Zazen is good for nothing, um, but it sounds like it provides a function in uh, your day-to-day -day life and almost like a reality check in a, in a sense. Uh, it brings you back to you know, your being reality right now. Uh, and I'm wondering, because um, I, I feel like you could almost get addicted to Zazen. And, and how do you be how could you be neutral about not sitting for or can, can you sit for wanting to have that reality check or or uh, are you trying to, uh, hmm, how to say how do you how do you sit without it becoming a necessity in your life or maybe it is a necessity but I don't know how to <laughs> without becoming addicted to yes, something yes. Probably there's not many, but there's exact, uh, there is in fact a few people who get addicted to the Zen or kind of, um, they basically hate the game, so they want to be free from the game as long as possible. There's, there's 24 hours of the day, their ideal would be to spend 24 hours of the day in the Zen. And maybe they have to take a pee and maybe they have to eat a little bit, but they try to reduce that to the minimum. Um, and at least from the Mahayana perspective there's a problem with that because you can't help others to escape the game if, if only you escape the game so what? so what? there's one person liberated but how about the rest? what do you do for the rest? and if the answer is nothing 
that's not such a good answer. So the reality check at Antaj is, well, that's why we have SAMU, that's why we have retreats, that's why we talk with visitors, that's why we answer the phone, uh, we go to town uh, from time to time to back. We, it's not that we try to be as secluded uh, from society as possible, but we... Um, stay in touch with uh, society, we make ourselves available, we even have Wi-Fi here. Um, you probably noticed already I'm spending a lot of time also to, to be on YouTube and stuff like that. Um, that's time that I'm obviously not spending uh, doing Zazen. But well, even if you're here as a training monk, doing Zazen like say 3000 hours a year is not an option like you you can do even if you do all the hosan zazen um probably at one point somebody's get you gonna get you out of the room and tell you well hey uh, can you check the electric fence that's more important than sitting so that's when the re reality check happens uh, but i mean um is it do you think it's all right that we sit zazen for that purpose of like using Zazen as a reality check, grounding you back to, because it almost sounds contradictory to the fact that, you know, it's good for nothing, but mm. again, I feel like it's good for realizing you're here and now, and that kind of sounds like it's something as well. Well, in a way, it's, it's kind of, you could even say Zazen is the only thing that's good for something. Um, because everything else is just part of the game. Even mindfulness, as it's usually taught in society, is just a tool to make you better at the game. So if you think about that the game is going to be over sooner or later, and the time that you spend absorbed in the game is time that you lose sight of, of this one day that you have only once. Actually, everything except the Zen is good for nothing. And so then it's the only thing that's good for something because it brings you back into this one day. And hey, you have only this one day once in your life. And that's now. And if you don't live it now, nobody is going to do it. And you can't do it tomorrow. <coughs> you might have another day tomorrow if you're lucky and live it now. So Zazen is, in that respect, yes, it's good for something. And maybe it's the only thing that's good for something. Nothing else. We have no bedtime, but tomorrow is going to be early. So if you have no more questions, I would finish here. And yeah, all the best to you, Axel. Thank you for coming. And I hope that I see the rest of you tomorrow <laughs> for the campfire. <laughs> I mean, maybe you want to join Axel. <laughs> it's always possible, but. Hopefully we can have a campfire tomorrow. Okay, thank you for listening and thank you for your questions for the Dharma talk. There's a second part of the chant, you find it on the paper. It starts with <coughs> Shuzhou Muhen. Shuzhou Muhen say. Oh
Krishna.